Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the briefing, the SFIC briefing of faith leaders on the issue of racial equity in these times of COVID-19 with special speaker, Executive Director Cheryl E. Davis from the San Francisco Human Rights Commission. This event is hosted by the San Francisco Interfaith Council and supported by the Joint Information Center of the San Francisco Emergency Operations Center. Just a few quick housekeeping items. Audio, video, and chat will be monitored and recorded for record keeping, training, and quality assurance purposes. By default, all participants will be muted and video turned off in order to minimize distractions. And to submit a question or comment, please select the chat button at the bottom of your screen and send a message to the Q&A. Your questions and comments will be collected and provided to the SFIC after the meeting for follow-up and or distribution. And any people who live or work in San Francisco can now get tested for COVID-19. For more information, visit sf.gov backslash get tested SF or call 311. And bars and restaurants that serve food can now open for outdoor dining. If you go take advantage of that, when you're eating out, please remember to wear face covering when you're not eating or drinking. No large group tables, unless you're in the same household and please sit at least six feet from other tables. Again, welcome to the meeting, and I will now hand it over to SFIC Executive Director Michael Pappas. Thank you so much, Becky. Uh, good morning, I'm Michael Pappas, and on behalf of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, I wanna welcome you to this week's online briefing for faith leaders. Everyone, no matter their race, economic, or immigration status, gender, age, or ability, feels the impact of the coronavirus in some way. The global pandemic's breathtaking impact on the well being and security of our family, friends, and neighbors, and on our economy, healthcare, and social services, and beyond, has moved from abstractness to harsh reality. But people who are already targeted, marginalized and underserved will feel the pain more than others. For these communities, the COVID-19 comes on top of existing economic, health, education, gender, and informational inequities, as well as state violence that has shaped their lives. Crisis situations such as pandemics, natural disasters, and social flashpoints often amplify racial biases that are deeply rooted in our history. These historically rooted structures, processes, and practices often get in the way of equitable security and opportunity for all. The San Francisco Interfaith Council welcomes San Francisco Human Rights Commission Executive Director Cheryl Evans Davis, who will address the issue of racial equity in these times of the coronavirus as the feature presenter at this week's online briefing for faith leaders. This program is hosted by the San Francisco Interfaith Council in collaboration with the Emergency Operations Center's Joint Information Center. And now allow me to welcome the Chairman of the Board of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, Koshi Kroy. Thank you, Michael. Good morning, everyone. As Michael mentioned, my name is Ko Sheik, and it is my honor to be uh, the chair of the board of the council and welcome all of you on behalf of the board. Uh, ever since the shelter in place began, uh, the council has hosted these weekly gatherings to give us all an opportunity to delve into the most important topics uh, in our lives right now. And I cannot think of a 
topic that has greater import or pertinence than this morning. So I do want to give a special uh, acknowledgement to our featured speaker, Dr. Cheryl Davis, and we have a truly esteemed panel. I want to thank all the panelists for joining us this morning as well. Uh, if this is your first time to an Interfaith Council event, a special welcome to you. At the beginning of each Interfaith Council event or meeting, we have an interfaith statement that we like to read. This is an interfaith community. Whatever our individual belief, it can be freely expressed here with no apologies. If we are invited to offer a prayer in this setting, it should be offered according to the tradition with which we identify. If we are invited to speak on a subject from the perspective of our tradition, we are free to do so without fear of offending those who come from another tradition. We come together as people of faith to learn from each other that we might better understand the multiplicity of faith traditions in our city and in our world. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Coach Sheik. And now to ground us in a meditative moment, we welcome the San Francisco Muslim Community Center's resident Imam, Imam Abu Qadir Alamin. Thank you very much. Uh, at this uh, <clears throat> meeting, I would like to reflect on what we call the a refuge prayer. It's a prayer that is often um, relied on when we are faced with difficulty and challenges in our life. And I would recite the English translation. O oh Allah, we seek refuge with you from anxiety and grief seek refuge from lack of strength and laziness. We seek refuge from cowardliness and miserliness. We seek refuge from being overpowered by debt and the oppression of men. O oh Allah, suffice us with what is lawful. Keep us away from what you have prohibited. And with your favors, make us depend on none except you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Imam Abu Qadir Alamin, and thank you for your support of the Interfaith Council these many, many years. It is my distinct, is my distinct privilege uh, to welcome today Dr. Cheryl Evans Davis, the Executive Director of the San Francisco Human Rights Commission. I had the great honor and uh, privilege of serving with uh, Director Davis on the commission and then uh, uh, with her as director, and she's done an impeccable job especially in these uh, fragile times. Uh, Father Paul Fitzgerald, president of the University of San Francisco and I serve on the Economic Recovery Task Force for the city. And uh, Director Davis gave a very, very important uh, presentation to our task force uh, not two weeks ago. And I, I felt that this, this presentation was not only apropos, but imperative to share with our faith leaders. And so with that, uh, Director Davis, we welcome you, you honor us with your presence, and we thank you uh, and, and give you the stage. Thank you so, so much. Um, I always want to say Commissioner Pappas. Um, just really grateful for the invitation. Um, the Interfaith Council has a very special place in my heart. I appreciate the work and the leadership of Koshik as well as Michael Pappas and the, the legacy of Rita Simmel and the folks that are doing this work. I'm also honored to be with uh, the Imam. I appreciate his meditation and his um, bringing us in with the prayer and three amazing um, women that I have the pleasure of knowing, Michelle, Veronica, and Mary Wardell. So I just really am grateful here. I would love at some point to come back and share. I know you used to do faith journeys. That has always been my dream to share my faith journey with this space. I. Um, I feel like so much of this work, and I, I'm sure that um, I know for, from conversations that Michelle and Veronica have very similar stories that this work we do is embedded in um, just our faith journeys and the, the way that we were raised and the importance of it. So thank you for holding this space and creating opportunities for folks. Um, you know, this is quite an interesting time that we are in, and I will share um, some slides and, and go through and have a little conversation and look forward to um, being in conversation with, um, 
with Monique and with, with, with Veronica, Michelle, and Dr. Cordell Giraduzzi. So San Francisco Human Rights Commission, as um, Michael Pappas mentioned, had the opportunity to share with the Economic Recovery Task Force and have some conversations around the equity in this conversation and what that would look like. So I will share a little bit of what was shared in that space. And the first thing that I would ask is that we think about in this planning for recovery, who gets to recover? And what does that look like? Um, let's start with rethinking how we talk about going back to normal. There are definitely um, some people who don't want to go back to normal because normal wasn't necessarily great or good um, or something that they were um, enjoying. Um, things were never no normal for our vulnerable populations. We can plan reopening, but let's think about something different than normal. Um, and let's think about how we rebuild for resilience and really support folks. Um, I know Veronica Shepard has experienced this. A lot of folks were able during this time to get food distribution and quality food and access to food from restaurants um, as a part of our response to the crisis that before this pandemic did not have those kind of opportunities and that access. Racial and economic uh, inequities are embedded in our country system and we know that San Francisco was noted for having one of the largest wealth disparities um, prior to the pandemic. So the coronavirus has um, compounded that for our Black, Brown, Asian, and Indigenous communities. We have a social and moral obligation and responsibility to acknowledge and address and repair this. So when we are thinking about planning for recovery, we really have got to get beyond just the the data around businesses and the economic piece of this and really think about the heart and soul of our, of our communities and how we're gonna really repair and address that. Um, today's recovery is going to require us to use some different tools. The resources and tools that we're gonna do to really address the inequity that existed before and that we're gonna have to address as we come out of this um, is really focusing on equity, accountability, honesty, empathy, engagement, understanding. We are gonna to have to expand our voc vocabulary and we have got to stop just looking at the ideas of finances and buildings and infrastructure. And again, really think about the people at the heart of this and the folks who um, were already worse off, what it looks like coming out on the other side of this. Um, and that is going to require us to really think about the difference between equality and equity. Um, you know, the difference between things being equal and making sure that everybody has five um, split between them and equitable, which is about fair. If you only need two, then you should give the other three to someone else. So as we think about this, redefining how we talk about fair, equality versus equity in these conversations. Um, when we use these tools in a meaningful way, um, we're going to get to more than just um, recovery. We're going to get to justice in some way. So again, the difference between equity and equality, really looking at equality as measuring something and saying whether everybody has the same amount and equity is much more subjective. It is looking at the situation from person to person and understanding that and examining it and making our response based on what is best for each individual and each situation versus just kind of doing a blanket distribution. Um, equality is not concerned about the gaps that are being experienced between communities or groups. And equity is looking at those differences and those gaps and trying to, um, uh oh, Becky, um, there we go. Um, and, and trying to, let's see. Becky, are you now sharing? Or what's the, let's see. There we go. I'm going to. So we are um, looking at the gaps between the groups and addressing them. Um, and then when we treat people equally, we may not be treating them fairly. So understanding that if we are talking about somebody that might be um, vision impaired versus someone who is able to see, we don't give them the same tools and say, read this. We have to think about it in a very different way. And that is what equity versus equality is, is about. Um, and we ultimately need to be making sure that not everybody just gets the same thing that folks are getting 
what they need. So the hard part around this is data-driven conversations, that it's gonna be difficult conversations. We need to disaggregate the data and not treat communities as monolithic. Part of this conversation is if we think about before the pandemic and San Francisco had less than 2% unemployment rate. But when we went into certain communities and certain demographics, some of them were in the double digits in terms of unemployment rates. Of the OMI, Ingleside, um, the outer, the, they were double digits for in, uh, with regards to unemployment rates. African Americans were in the double digits for unemployment rates. We have to really look at the data and not just look at it big bucket, but we have to kind of break it apart. Um, for instance, the issues and needs of the API community cannot, we have to really take that apart and think about the needs of our Samoan population versus our Filipino population versus our Chinese. Like we're not going to give one, translate into one language, right? Like we have to stop thinking and using these broad terms and be much more specific. We need to not be afraid of bad news that may show that we're missing certain communities or that we have these gaps because the only way we're going to close the gaps is to know that they exist. Um, qualitative data, the storytelling and understanding and hearing people's stories is just, important, just as important as the quantitative data that tells us how many. Because everyone's story might be different and the solutions to res resolve the challenges we face. It will be an uncomfortable process, but that's where we're going to grow. That's where we're going to see the change begin to happen when we push through hard things. So kind of this allocation of resources and how we're framing and how I've been thinking about this is if we're thinking about recovery in these terms of repair and restore that we want to put back in the original state, there are certain neighborhoods, communities, people that we do not want to put them in the original state that they were living in before the pandemic. They have seen the, the attention and the um, additional resources be applied to their communities and to their needs, and they don't want to necessarily see that go away. We have to improve and make things better. If we're going to improve, we're going to make it better and or more useful. We also have to own the fact that some of these things, systems that we have in place, are we're going to have to demolish and tear them down. Um, we're going to have to rebuild some things and put the structure back but it might be a little bit different. And then in some places we may tear it totally down and have to do something new and build in a new way. And then after we do all of this, we need to think about how we're gonna sustain it and regenerate. So some of what I had already mentioned in terms of unemployment, um, you know, again, certain neighborhoods we're seeing two, two, two to three times the citywide rate of unemployment, the health disparities, um, social determinants of health, were, could have predicted where we were seeing and where we are seeing um, this, this virus impact certain communities more. The achievement gaps, which I know Reverend Brown has been beating that drum and having that conversation around the disparities and what's going on within the school district, those were issues before the pandemic. Right? And so now we're talking about certain neighborhoods that have limited Wi-Fi or no Wi-Fi and that we are gonna, we're going to give them devices and think that that's going to change what's happening in their home or with their learning. Or we are having challenges with the asking parents to teach at home, but that the, the, the homework or the languages that they're given the work in are not the languages that are spoken at home. So these gaps were in existence. They were only going to be exacerbated by what's happening. Happening. And similar to the income gap, we've heard a lot about people losing their jobs. But again, just want to say there were a, a whole slew of people who didn't have jobs before. And now when we come out of this pandemic, they're going to be competing with people who were most recently um, employed. And that's going to shift and make a difference in the dynamic as well. So the disproportionately impacted Right, as we think about this and we think about equity, as we build out and think about recovery, we need to think about those folks who were disproportionately impacted. We know that certain industries were hit harder than others. Um, we know that certain individuals were hit harder than others. And we need to think about this, not just with regards to the financial impacts, but the mental and physical impacts of COVID-19 have had on people that are unable to work or access even the relief funds. Um, those folks are gonna need a little bit more support when we come on the other side of this. When we think about neighborhoods, 
the tracker has shown, right, that we, the COVID-19 tracker that is on um, the Data SF site has shown that the emission in Bayview, Tenderloin, Sunnydale, Potrero, and Fillmore have been hard hit by this, but we also know that our API communities are being impacted. We need to take that into consideration as we think about um, the recovery process. And then this piece, you know, like I know now I, I have said to myself, you know, we keep talking about these two diseases that we're fighting, right? This fighting the coronavirus as well as racism. But racism, we have been fighting long before the last few months. And we saw this play out when um, the early onset of uh, COVID-19, where you know, it has been called the Chinese virus and that people were not going into um, Chinatown and not visiting Asian restaurants, but at the same time, Asian community was feel, um, feeling and witnessing people blaming them and um, putting the burden of this on their, their at their feet. Um, the Latinx community has been hard hit locally in terms of um, contracting the virus and feeling similar pressure around do they get tested because they want to make sure that they're able to still support their families and go to their jobs. Um, and so, but this conversation from the beginning nationally was talking about African Americans being um, most likely to die from the, the virus. And so we have a lot to do when we talk about race and ethnicity and we talk about the disproportionately impacted and what we're going to do to address that. So again, recovery is gonna require us to think about it in terms of these, these phases of what does it look like to repair and restore? What does it look like to tear down the systems that have contributed to this? What does it look like to rebuild and build? And then ultimately to sustain and regenerate, right? To sustain the things that are working and then regenerate and start new with the things that are not. Um, I think, these are the challenging pieces <clears throat> because in a lot of ways we want to focus on repairing and restoring. And if we're going to get to equity in this town, that is not, that can't be the approach because repairing and restoring some of the things that we had in place um, pre COVID-19 is not going to make some people be better off. It's actually going to put them worse off. And so we have to think about what it looks like to tear down the systems that were not effective, that were not making things better and that were actually causing harm. And we have to make a distinction between whether we're going to rebuild or build in certain places. And for anyone, which I have not because I, I don't own my home, but for anyone that's had to do this kind of make a decision between whether you're going to rebuild, restore or build something new, there are times and occasions when it costs more to restore, you know, a building back to its natural state, the way that it was. I think about the, the painstaking work that folks that are um, restoring Victorians or that want to restore um, furniture, right? It is a labor of love, but it is also very intensive and uh, costs a lot of money. And so sometimes to restore is actually more than to just build it anew. And I think some of this is the question that we have to ask. What's the investment? What are, what's the commitment to actually move some things forward? Some of the activities that we've been doing at the Human Rights Commission um, and with our community partners is to really think about repair and restore, having those workshops and trainings, to have conversations with folks around what that looks like. We have also been doing, prior to the pandemic, working with school groups to do some of that work. Right now, we're working with um, the, the J, with, um, JCYC, Japanese Community Youth Council, CYC, um, as well as um, Third Street Youth Clinic to do some cross-cultural justice. We're trying to build relationships and do some work between the Black and Asian community and having conversations and leading that, having young people lead that. Um, we're building new coalitions and efforts. We've been working with the Latino Task Force in the mission, um, working with a group called Mega Black that is trying to organize and do work and build coalitions around um, the African-American Black community. Um, we are thinking about how do we bring those folks together so that we don't end up with this tension around um, who the city is supporting and where they are investing, but that we are really working collaboratively to address the challenges that 
um, the pandemic has caused in our communities of color. Building and rebuilding, we've done some new things, again, mentioned Reverend Brown earlier, and have heard from folks we did with our faith-based leaders, caravans, driving through um, different communities, passing out face coverings and hand sanitizer and, um, mat and gloves, and also passing out information to talk about what it looks like to stay healthy right, and to get tested. And um, the faith-based leaders have been really great about the call to, to get more testing and have helped build those, um, those testing sites throughout the city. I think the challenge for us right now is how do we continue to provide resources and support? How do we continue to invest, um, especially in this crisis where we are experiencing um, some shortfalls and the budget crisis, but how do we then continue to invest in the communities that need the most support and resources? A framework that we built out a while ago from the Human Rights Commission, and these steps that we've identified to really help build equity is to assess conditions. First come in and understand where the gaps are, what the needs are, what the differences are, what it is that we need to be doing. And, and one of the tools that we ask people to use is the five whys, right? You ask why five times. You come in and you say, you know, African-American students are not learning. So why are they not learning? Well, they're not learning because, you know, someone may say that because they're not coming to school then why aren't they coming to school? Well, they're not coming to school because they can't get there. Um, it's too difficult to get there. They gotta take three buses to get across town. Why do we have to take three buses to get across town to get to school? So that just modeling this idea, of not just saying they're not learning, let's understand why folks are not learning. Let's understand what the resources are that we need to invest in that. And then the next step would be build bridges. Understanding like, how do we get to the answers of why? Right? Like, how do we really have a conversation and build trust and work with folks, develop allies and accomplices in this work? And then create opportunities for folks to share. The Creating Ladders is about how do we make a pathway for young people, their families, the communities to share their ideas, to share power and control and move those things up. And then cultivate collaboration, which is why I love the Interfaith Council in this work, is that it is bringing together folks, unlikely partners, as folks would say, right? From different religions and beliefs and faiths to come together really to advance equity and do what's best for um, community. And so we have to do more of that, cultivating collaboration, meaningful partnerships, unlikely partnerships, and partnerships, the current ones that we already have. And then at the end of it all, consider impact. What impact are we having? What difference are we making? Because if it's not working, then it means we should start all over again and come back to it um, and try it again. So ultimately, this journey has been an interesting one, right? Because we are having to have a conversation about something we should have been having a conversation about before. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement and the, the, what's happened with George Floyd and what's happening with xenophobia and all these other pieces, we really have got to make this intentional, make it consistent and be committed to this conversation, even after um, some people are able to get back to normal and go back to life the way it was. We have to recognize and realize that some folks don't want to go back to that. They want to go back to better. And we have definitely got to um, explore and work together to do that. So thank you so much, Michael, for this opportunity to share um, and um, participate in this, this conversation. I really appreciate it. Director Davis, as you were speaking, I couldn't help but think about the mayor's tireless efforts uh, to expedite uh, the process of development so that people in need of housing uh, can, can be housed. And it sounds like you're on a parallel track um, in creating and expediting and, 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 and getting us to build uh, a different kind of house. And, uh, and thank you. The metaphor was very powerful. The presentation was very powerful. You've given us not only a foundation, but also a, a structure with some solid bones. Now we're going we're gonna to continue the conversation. Uh, as you had mentioned early on, uh, three of your colleagues um, who are just uh, boots on the ground, if you will, uh, will, will share how uh, their work in this er arena has been impacted by the COVID-19, and then they're gonna ask a question of you for a response. Uh, we'll begin with uh, uh, Michelle Myers Chambers. I've known Michelle for over a decade. 
uh, through her work with the FAITHS program at the San Francisco Foundation. The San Francisco Foundation has been uh, an invaluable uh, supporter of the Interfaith Councils from, from the get-go. And Michelle's work in this area uh, is personal, but it, and, but it is also something she brings us all together to address these issues. So Michelle, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you, Michael and SFIC for giving me the opportunity to present this morning. It's uh, my honor to be with such an illustrious a group of, of women, uh, particularly Cheryl and I go way back to West Oakland, and of course, Veronica and Professor Mary, so thank you. So Rick, Cheryl, your presentation was excellent. I want to steal a couple of your slides, so I'm happy that they'll send us all of the information. <laughs> um, you know, at the San Francisco Foundation, our uh, main North Star is racial and economic equity. So you hit on a lot of those um, subject areas and topics and really explained what the commission was doing around that. And as the FAITH program, Foundation Alliance with Interfaith to Heal Society, that's what our acronyms mean, which means that we're a bridge builder for the faith community and philanthropy. And it was really created, you mentioned Reverend Brown. Reverend Brown came to the San Francisco Foundation 26 years ago and demanded that the San Francisco Foundation create some type of mechanism to support the faith community. So I'm glad that he's continuing to do that work and he's always been an ally for equality and equity within the black community and beyond. So bravo for uh, Reverend Brown. The work that we've been doing has been really building the capacity of faith-based congregations and faith-based organizations within our five Bay Area counties. And particularly with COVID um, happening, we know that first responders are not only those who are in hospitals, but first responders is the faith community. There are their congregations. When folks are in despair, they don't know where to go. They're gonna to go to the faith community, to a congregation or a faith-based organization whatever their spiritual pathway is because they know that they're gonna receive the help. And so how can we, how can the commission continue to provide the services that's necessary to build up those organizations to be stronger than what they are, as you, as you said, to be better than what they were before the crisis and to also be on the, you know, if they're not number one on the list, but they should be number five on the list when folks say, hey, we need to go out and do some work in the community and check in with the community. The faith community should be number five on that list if it's a list of one through five. How can we continue to build the visibility of the faith community with the support of the HRC and really give them the bones and the meat that they need to be able to survive? We want all of our faith-based institutions and congregations to be able to survive, to survive beyond COVID-19 and you talked about the racism um, that existed, uh, particularly in the, in the Black church, the Samoan church, the Latinx church, and the Asian churches. How can we bring those communities closer together to be able to support each other and not be pitted against each other? Because we, when you think about a neighborhood, we're all in the neighborhood, but we're segregated within that neighborhood, and we really need each other to survive. Because when there's more people, there's more power. So not only on the resource end, but how can we leverage their organizing power, the congregation's organizing power to move forward, to change some policy, and to demand that the investment comes within those faith communities that are gonna be in the communities when programs come and go, when crises come and go, when it's not gonna be popular again to say that Black Lives Matter, the faith community is gonna be there still doing the work, still making those connections, still providing for folks, and we know still testing folks. We, we need to, as you said, we need to have these centers to be test sites. We know that they've already been doing work around food security for our families that's going through crisis right now. So I'm gonna stop there and let you. Let you no, 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 I, <laughs> look, I, I, you, you taking me to church because I'm like, everything you are saying, I'm like, amen. Um, I mean, we have been really, Veronica and I have been having this conversation around like, the ongoing work that she's doing with the faith-based coalition, but we, um, African-American faith-based coalition. Michelle, you are right on point. And one of the main things that we have been doing, I didn't mention in this, is that we've been working on an outreach and engagement strategy and really using what we've been building out during this crisis 
as a tool for not just the HRC, but other cities. And a couple of weeks ago with the mayor, we introduced that um, to our partners, um, to our city agencies and our community partners and had our community partners share. First and foremost is we have to redefine how we think about subject matter experts. It is not about who has a degree behind their name. It is about who has what we need at this point in time, the relationships on the ground, the ability to get the messaging out, um, the ability to make it plain and make sure that folks understand it. So we worked with our, um, in different communities in the mission, we work with the Latino task force around the messaging and the, the collateral that went out because they were able to tell us what that looked like. And that includes Good Samaritan and other groups that are a part of that. Then in um, the Bayview area, we work with um, the faith-based folks. So again, telling us, look, you know, this language is not getting it, you know, like, let's talk about the Rona, tell them the Rona is not a game and like doing that work. But then when we took the Rona is not a game to some of our other communities, they were like, what's the Rona? So, you know, understanding and listening to community on how to get that message out um, is critical. And I think what we are working to do with um, the Joint Information Center and the Emergency Operations Center is what does it look like to say moving forward, these are the key partners. Faith based has to be on the list and it has to be critical in that conversation. And so um, that is the main thing that we're trying to push for is how do we center that? Because we do not have all the answers because we've been working um, at the city for you know 20 years. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Davis. Uh, we're segueing now uh, in, into Veronica Shepard. And I, Veronica and I seem to, uh, our paths seem to cross and, and at critical points in our careers. I, I first met Veronica in a church basement uh, uh, when at that time, the director of the redevelopment agency, uh, Fred Blackwell, who is now the, uh, the CEO of the San Francisco Foundation, was delivering a report to African-American pastors on the outmigration of the African American community. And uh, that's where I first met Veronica. And since then, uh, uh, we've been thrown together at different times, but most importantly now, uh, Veronica Shepard is the program manager at the San Francisco Department of Public Health, and she's a coordinator of the African American Faith Based Coalition. I have incredible respect for her and her work. She is boots on the ground, uh, she, she walks the walk. And so, Veronica, the stage is yours. Thank you, thank you, Michael, and thank you everyone for being on a call this early in the morning. Um, <laughs> and happy birthday to you. Well, I celebrated my 39th birthday again <laughs> yesterday. Um, funny story, I was telling my grandson when he was about five, I was 39 and then the next year my birthday came and I was 39 and then the following year he went, so grandma, you can't be 39 again, can you? You have to be 40 now. And I went, okay, I'll take 40. <laughs> so I'm stopping at 40. So thank you all. And again, I wanna validate and honor my wonderful sisters that are also presenting and speaking on this call, Cheryl, Mary, and Michelle. It's an honor to be at the same table with you all. The San Francisco African-American Faith-Based Coalition gave birth at the very end of November, 2016. To be exactly precise, it was the day after our current president was voted into office. That's why I remember it so. And we, I was with supporting the San Francisco Health Improvement Partnership and we realized that the faith community wasn't fully present in the conversation of health and wellness. We pulled GL Hodge and I, who were both serving on the San Francisco Health Improvement Partnership, pulled together faith leaders and asked them with all the resources in San Francisco, what are your barriers? And they told us at that meeting that we don't know the health department. The health department doesn't come and talk to us. We don't talk to each other and we don't know your resources. And from that point up until today, we were able to systematically pull together. At that time, it was about 16, 17 churches. Today, it's over 21 and growing. Many more partnerships wanna join this coalition. And they have been working cross denominations 
around the health and wellness of their congregants and communities. The majority of these churches have high African-American congregants. When this pandemic hit and shelter in place immediately took effect, it had a huge impact on the coalition, specifically because we have a lot of seniors and people with comorbidities and disabilities that were isolated in with no resources around food. What I do also with the health department is I do racial equity as well as food security work. So it was clear that there was another layer of trauma already happening with people who were afraid to go outside. Over the four years, this coalition has been able to build an infrastructure of support, trust, and leadership that allowed them across the city open up opportunities to get people food. We had a partner, SF New Deal, that came to my door and said, I want to work with your coalition on rolling out meals to the community and keep restaurants open and keep restaurant workers working. Together, in the first three to six weeks, this coalition pushed out 30,000 meals across the city. They were the first people on the ground to actually hit the ground and get people meals and ascertain whatever health and wellness needs they were facing at that time. Because of that infrastructure that was already in place, they were able to do a lot of great work. These are men and women from as young as 20s to as old as 80s that are part of this coalition. It's been amazing to watch people who know how to spin on a dime and make things happen. What did surface over these last few weeks was layers and layers of mental health issues, fear, uncertainty, the whole testing process, because as many of you know on this call, things were kind of rolling out every day, each day with new decisions about what our city needed. I am so grateful that I have partners like Cheryl, Michelle, and Mary. I could reach out and call and say, what are we doing? What are we doing? What are we doing? I saw Mother Brown. I am born and raised here in the Bayview. My father was the third black muni driver here, and my mother was a welder at the shipyard during World War II. I have a very long history in this community, in this city. And so this is my heartbeat to help our community, to see people suffering and now have a pandemic on top of it added whole new layers of how people were forced to engage. What I am proud of is that the support that I've been given by these dear women on the phone, you, Michael, and so many others even on this call to help us come together and actually address people from cradle to grave. We were able to learn so much about people and what they were facing while they're trying to stay sheltered in place. I saw personally families that were 10 people in a household and one person was working. We were able to talk as a coalition about the mental health and wellness that was impacting our communities. And Michael, again, with his wonderful connections and partnerships, brought together another group of people who are now there currently creating a phone call, a warm line, a friendship line for our communities across the city to call when they just need somebody to talk to or a word of prayer. That is develop in, in development right now. I have been reached out by so many people to want to support this community. And currently we're in a conversation of what is the African-American agenda? What is the plan for our community? What is the plan for those that are suffering pre-COVID and now, as Cheryl said, even more so? I want to be very authentic and say, honestly, Michael, this has been pretty exhausting work. And I was telling Cheryl, I'm very angry. I was angry before this pandemic because of how people are forced to live. 
And even now, as things are slowly transitioning, I'm still hearing the narrative of going back to business as usual. And as Cheryl said, it was never good for us even before then. The coalition is currently trying to come together now as they're transitioning into their next stage of what's the path they're gonna take beyond food security. Because as many of these women on the call know, our lives are impacted multifaceted ways from cradle to grave in our household. When I recently learned about a party that was given in Sunnydale a weekend ago and that people the next day were impacted by the COVID virus as young as 10 years old. It's saddening. How are we going to continue to tell our community to stay safe? I'm also in a conversation right now to do a media marketing campaign that the coalition, Cheryl, Michelle, Mary, we can all start doing constant messaging for our communities to stay safe. I know the isolation and I've heard it across the city from so many partners and people who work with similar communities. People are afraid, people are scared, and yet they're tired of being shut in and sheltered in place. So we, we have to figure out, as Cheryl stated earlier, new ways of engagement that we all thrive and not just certain populations. <clears throat> it has really truly been my honor to do this work. I carry this torch high. I carry it when I'm tired. I carry it because I stand on the ancestors that allowed me to be here and do this work. I want to close by saying, and I, I'm going to continue to say it, and this is for everyone on the call. If we are not dismantling this structural racism and violence, then if we go back to doing projects and programs, we're not shifting the narrative. We're just continuing to band-aid the approach. From the health department lens, I do have the most recent data of the cases. I will be sending that out to you, Michael, to publicize across this continuum. But for the Black community, you know we have a population of 43,000 people. And as of June 1st, 4,700 of them have been tested. We've had, of that 4,000, 131 are positive, and we've had four deaths. That is effective as of June 1st. The cities, the neighborhoods, I'm just going to list three with the most highest rates are the Bayview, the Mission, and the Tenderloin. Even our Native American population that is very low in San Francisco, it's about 1,300 people that identify as Native American. We've had 11 cases, which is 4% of their population, and they only make up 2%. So there's work to do, and there's more ways to do it. And I'm going to encourage and challenge you all listening and watching. Let's come together. This is a time to build partnerships, to have allies, because we as the Black community cannot unpack this economic, structural violence and racism alone. We need everyone's support across religions, across faith, across culture, across every aspect of our life so we can band together because we won't be silent anymore. Everyone deserves to thrive in this city and we have the capacity to do it. Thank you so much, Cheryl, and thank you, Michael. Thank you. Cheryl, did you want to respond to any of these points? I mean, you know, Veronica and I have talked at length about so much of this, and I think the main thing is, um, same thing that Michelle was um, saying as well, how do we center? How do we prioritize? And how do we, I mean, I have appreciated um, Veronica's advocacy around the food. Like we were able, she's the one that really pointed out we had, you know, we were spending $5 per meal pre-pandemic and then um, during the pandemic in an effort to support restaurants that were closed, we upped the amount of money that was paid per meal. And now we want people to go back to um, this food that's half the cost, right? Like these are a lot of the challenges that we've got to figure out on the other side. And I think that's the part around the narrative, right? How do we not just start, not how we just not talk it, but actually do it. 
And that is the piece around the sustain and regenerate, right? Like we created these new practices, right? It's like giving someone, you know, if they're a meat eater, right? And saying, here is um, steak and then saying to them afterwards, now here is canned beef, right? Like and saying like, think it's, you know, be happy with, with both of them. And yes, if you're hungry, you will be happy with both of them. But what is our priority and how do we humanize and value people? Yes. Um, you know, this idea that folks should get um, leftovers from our cabinets, right, that mm -hmm. have been dinged up and that we sometimes don't even check to yes. see if the date is expired. Um, those are the things we have to challenge because we feel good because we're basically cleaning out our cabinets and Absolutely. making room for new stuff in our homes and thinking people should be grateful for the fact that I cleaned my cabinet out and gave them some stuff I don't want. Right. And, and can so, I jump on that, Cheryl? The mentality and Michael for everybody listening is it becomes a checkoff and it's a feel good for the people who are doing it. And there's a disconnect of how inhumane it is to the people receiving it. And, and, and we still have, that thinking that is making decisions about our communities. And this is my fight. Why are we giving certain communities robust produce and our community gets the charred, leftover, wounded, bruised food? Why is that even okay? And so it's challenging those narratives to say, no. And, be, and that's dismantling how we see each other as human beings. So you can want what got you a lot to... We have a lot to, we got a lot of work to do. And I yes. just want to be fair. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Mary Wardell Gerduzzi, uh, who wears many hats. Um, I know her as uh, not only the president of the police, uh, of the police committee, the president of the library commission, uh, but she also serves on the board of directors for the San Francisco Interfaith Council. But we first met, and, and I know that uh, Cheryl, uh, and, and, and I worked together with Mary on implicit bias training uh, for faith leaders uh, at the University of San Francisco. Uh, she is the Vice President of, of Diversity and Engagement and Community Outreach for the University of San Francisco. USF has been an incredible partner and a good part of that is because of, of Mary's leadership and, and vision. And so we welcome uh, Dr. Mary Wardell Yarduzzi. Thank you all so much. I actually was just fine listening to Veronica <laughs> and Michelle and Cheryl talk. And so if the time hadn't went down, that would have been actually been just fine with me because- um, We have plenty of time for you. Uh, my soul is really filled right now. Um, first of all, I just want to say thanks Cheryl so much just for her leadership and her the thought leadership. And, and I really loved um, just the, the framing in the um, construct of building um, and, 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 and all pieces of it. I mean, the content and the framework is everything, but the way in which she built in the visuals. And so it's things that people can actually grab hold to, um, regardless of where, they're in, where people are entering the equity conversation, because not everybody understands these principles. And um, part of the work is, is to make it plain enough or to make it simple enough so that somebody that has significant um, resources um, and has positionality, um, um, but yet um, is not doing what they need to do, can um, then um, be able to say, you know, I understand these kind of nuanced and quite sophisticated concepts in a very uh, 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 simplistic, but at the same time, very nuanced perspective. So I just want to thank you so much, Cheryl, uh, for your thought leadership um, um, and all of this. You know, so Veronica was, um, I want to pick up with some of the last comments that Veronica ended on because she was at, uh, almost ending with a question, you know, why, why are we continue to see these things? And, 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 and one of the things that I've tried to do and I continue to do with the, you know, thank God for the, the, and the blessing and the platform that I have is to ch continue to use the tools that, um, um, that I have as well as the institution in which I um, am an ambassador with and, and work with, this ideas of, of, of reflection and examine um, and how do we understand um, who we are 
um, as opposed to always focus, focusing on where do we go from here? Because um, as Cheryl has said and others have said, right now we're, we're, we're already hearing conversations around um, wh where do we go from here? And it immediately goes to um, the next initiative and program, which is essentially the rep in, 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 in the um, framework um, that we just were uh, uh, presented, it was essentially the repair piece. Um, but the real work is really around how did, we, how did we get here? And that has been the equity framework in which I have been um, focusing on um, uh, in Jesuit higher education, obviously at the University of San Francisco, but uh, even more broadly in Jesuit higher education to help us to do this examine, uh, which is an examination of the individual to understand you know, what is our racial, uh, racialized formations? You know, how do we understand race um, fundamentally? Um, and we happen to be as, uh, important institutional actors um, who are uh, called to fulfill roles and to do um, um, specific work on behalf of the communities and stakeholders. But how often do we do that reflective work, which, of, which is a part of the Ignatian tradition of, of uh, being a contemplative in action, you know, but you can't necessarily do all the acting and the repairing and where do we go from here if you haven't done the, the, the contemplative piece um, from the lens of understanding what does racial equity mean? Um, what does it mean in my life? Uh, what does it mean in regard to um, the circumstances of my birth, um, the circumstances of the, uh, the pathway that I was able to walk to get to this particular place. If you happen to be working at an institution um, um, that is located in the city and county of San Francisco, um, and you have all these uh, uh, resources and responsibilities, before you can move forward on where do we go, from, uh, where do we go uh, next, you really have to do that individual reflective work. And so the first thing that we've been doing is creating a, um, uh, what I call a, uh, an array of, of capacity building activities to help people around that racial formation, um, um, to help them um, almost sometimes in a 101, you know, because, you know, we are an institution, so we can think of like first level, second level, third level, but to help people around their overall racialized literacy. Because if you don't have um, a uh, strong enough or, uh, or sophisticated enough or foundational enough racialized history to understand your history in relation to the histories of marginalized individuals, whether it would be black identified, indigenous, and other peoples of color, um, as well as other people with other uh, marginalized identities. If you don't understand your relationship of your history in relation to theirs, then how might you, how might we as institutional actors be able to do the work um, outside of be going beyond this, um, uh, uh, coming up with initiatives and programs, which actually are just re, re, um, uh, regurgitations, I'm trying to think of the word, regurgitations of things we've seen before, but perhaps we put in some new words um, that, that sounds better. You know, um, you know, we put in words of equity uh, because we know we need to um, in, in, in how we describe it. And, and so that, that interior work, um, that internal work is so critical right now, I believe. And um, it is actually, I feel like I'm spending 65, 75% of my time on that work right now um, because, you know, be it for the bloodshed of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Amon Arbery and all of the other ones that have been the recent and then the ones before them and the ones that are after them, but, be, uh, but because of their blood uh, shed and because of the way in which particularly Mr. Floyd's um, um, death um, created a similar response, particularly in dominant and white identified communities um, uh, that, and, and, uh, that shocked uh, uh, them into feeling a, a sense of shame, a sense of guilt, a sense of, 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 of urgency. If it hadn't been for that type of opening, we may not be able to even do this type of work because of the ways in which um, we believe that we're already doing it, um, um, even though we have data and other experiences, qualitative and otherwise, to tell us differently. And so I, I, I feel like the greatest um, uh, thing that 
those of us that are trying to do this equity work, um, if we can, as we're doing, where do we go from here? We actually, we actually also have to hold this great opportunity of, of, of challenging in a way that we've never been able to do before the racial equity gaps uh, among institutional actors who have the positions right now um, that have had the positions for numbers of years um, that have been um, um, able to move the needle forward based upon um, uh, the, the, the goals of their institution and as well as the uh, uh, privileges as well as responsibilities of, of their organization, but yet have not been able to or were not able to because they haven't done this work. Um, and so the examination on the individual level. And then I have it as the examination of, you know, the internal work that we're doing on my campus um, and, uh, and, and this uh, racial equity uh, exam and framework is then looking at, you know, how is uh, the, what are the racialized elements of, of what we called the, um, the, the, the product of, of, of uh, and how we are doing it. So the curriculum itself, um, the co-curriculum itself, uh, the focus on the communities, um, who gets to uh, attend the school? Who gets to work at the institution? Um, um, how do we determine that? So I, I call that all the, the climate and the culture and all those uh, um, activities that makes up an institution. It's not just the walls, you know, and particularly since we're uh, operating virtually, the institutions are running, but we're not actually in our offices. Um, um, and so we know then that we created all this this institutional inertia that has a racialized context that actually is um, um, embedded racism all throughout all of those things that we do um, um, in the context of, 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 of the work that I do as a higher ed leader. And the last thing is the, what I call the institution work itself. And so it might be my institution, but in the case of, um, in the US there's 27, um, 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 uh, Jesuit universities and there's other Jesuit high schools, including St. Ignatius in the city. But to look at the racist structures fundamentally um, and, and the ways that the, the, the hierarchies of the institutions were formed um, and how is institutionalized racism within the DNA of the institution in and of itself. And so an exam, a, a racial equity examine um, that looks at the individual, but really a focus on the institutional actors um, and then looking at the, the, the work product that we do, um, and then looking at how the institution structures were focused. Um, and then the activities, you plug into that in into the really beautiful framework that uh, Director Davis provided in this presentation, the activities would be these capacity, you know, whether it be, you know, microaggressions, you know, helping people understand what they really are and how they impact um, the integrity, and not only of the admission, but the, how they harm people fundamentally, um, and what I call racial literacy work. Um, and ultimately, God willing, if we're any way successful in this, it will move, would move to uh, racial reconciliation. But the whole thing about where do we go from here, people want to talk about racial reconciliation right now, and part of my, my work is to kind of continue to elevate these conversations and this consciousness is like you can't go to reconciliation if you haven't been able to acknowledge um, the, the parts of which we have uh, left uh, behind um, marginalized and vulnerable communities um, in significant and racialized ways. Um, and then, so that requires us to be able to do, hold some truth and tell the truth. And so it's, a, it's, a, um, it's two questions. Um, how do we get here? So hold, spending all more time in that, how do we get here uh, while people are ready to run, <laughs> if you will, um, uh, where do we go from, uh, where do we go now? And um, not holding people back from that, but at the same time, taking this opportunity to really kind of go deeper, which I have to admit, I have, I, I've been in higher education in, in a California context now, it's been, well, 25 years, um, when I began at the California State University system um, and uh, um, uh, my first program that I worked in was an initiative called the Student Affirmative Action Program. And then um, <coughs> several years after that, Prop 209 came and it ended up abolishing the, the, that particular work as it was um, 
uh, communicated, but we continued that work. Um, we had to embed it differently in the CSU system. Well, the same thing now, um, there has not been a, an opening that I have seen in the course of the years as we have um, uh, present with us now to do not just equity work, but to do this racialized equity work and to do it openly and to do it honestly and to do it frankly. And so, um, so my question for uh, Director uh, Davis, forgive me for speaking too long, is what do you see is now the role, Cheryl, for um, the role of these anchor institutions? Because uh, Cheryl is, uh, is involved in the anchor institution work nationally. What do you see as the role of anchor institutions um, around um, um, and, and the racial equity framework, you know, um, um, leveraging um, uh, our positions, leveraging everything that anchor institutions represent, particularly in a U.S. context. Yeah, I am just, um, you all, I'm just in awe of all three of you and appreciate your, <laughs> your words. I'm just like writing feverishly as you all are speaking. And, and I think when you talk about racialized formations and some of what we said to um, in the conversation also with Michelle and, and Veronica about like subject matter experts, right? And anchor institutions have got to redefine who are the experts and what collaboration and partnership looks like. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, I'm working on right now is radically simple, right? And so you talked a lot about um, folks wanting to get to reconciliation. They want to get to this. They want to get to all these. And I think the institutions are looking for how do we study it? How do we report it? How do we talk about what we've done? And I just go to radically simple. When I think about the core of my education, I go back to, I, if I'm totally honest, I improve my reading skills in church because I had to learn my speeches and my poems and I had to do whatever. I learned public speaking because Black History Month and Easter and Christmas and all those things, I had to get up and say a speech. Yes. Radically simple. Those folks were teaching me skills that I probably never would have learned in school, culture and pride. I think about um, the power of song and we talk about mental health. I think about prayer and meditation and I can, I can hear my grandmother and have you any rivers that seem uncrawled. I can hear her in those moments of despair singing herself to wellness. So simple but so radical, right? Mm -hmm. I can think about the potions and the pieces of um, what happens to a dream deferred. Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it sags like a heavy load or does it explode? It's so radical, but it's so simple. Langston Hughes asking us to think about the explosion of what is Black Lives Matter. Where did it come from? When you talk about the roots and the history of that, radically simple is Maya Angelou saying life doesn't frighten me at all. Don't show me frogs and snakes and listen for my screams. If I'm afraid at all, it's only in my dreams. The idea that it's only in my dreams, I always think about Emmett Teal. His mother talks about sending him to the South, but she believed and bought into the dream of freedom and equity and forgot to teach her son about the realities of the South. And so he went down there thinking that he was equal because that's what the dream says. So the dreams are what frighten us, so radical to dream but so simple, no, it's not. It's simple to dream, but it's radical to try and make those dreams a reality, mm -hmm. right? And so part of this is anchor institutions have got to be radically simple. They have got to understand the core of humanity and what we really learn and how we really move things forward, mm -hmm. right? We cannot get away from, again, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise, right? Rising is simple, but it's also radical it's because radical. we are supposed to be trotted in the dust, right? We're supposed to be like the dirt, but we're rising like dust. Yeah. That's a radical thought. 
Yes. So if we are going to change and do all of this, we have got to be radically simple. We have got to get back to the basis of our faith and our hope that put us in these moments and getting to the root causes of this, right? When we think about it in the context of, I can see um, the imam on my screen and I see Veronica. And, like when we think about it, Pastor Bryant, in the context of how we were able to overcome. We cannot get back to the simplicity of what the fo old folks used to call the mourner's bench. Black mm -hmm. folks knew, slaves knew the importance of taking time out to mourn yes. and then recover from that. Absolutely. So when we talk about reconciliation, the songs, the slave songs, the history, the, the uh -huh. evolution of freedom and the civil rights movement, so simple, but so radical, right? Yeah. Yes. So I just think that that is the, the foundation of it. And that is really what I'm trying to, to work on. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I, I, this has been overwhelming. This is the 13th in our series. Each one of them has been a little different. I have to tell you, uh, in this one, I, I feel very humble to be in the presence of all of our presenters today. I also want to thank you all for recognizing the contributions of Reverend Dr. Amos Brown. Uh, who has reminded me and inspired me that people of faith have always been at the forefront of both the civil rights and the human rights movement. Uh, we are with you as partners, uh, Director Davis. Uh, we thank you profusely for your presentation today, as we do the Imam, uh, Koshik, of course, Michelle, Veronica, and Mary. Uh, we, we learned a lot today and what you had to say is going to reach not just the folks that were on this line, but the 5,000 e-subscribers who will receive this recording by day's end today. I also want to say a very special thank you to Cynthia Zambukas, uh, uh, be, without whom uh, she is my both my right and my left hand in helping us to uh, put these presentations out, as well as the Emergency Operations Center, Joint Information Center, uh, Coordinator John McKnight, and our virtual outreach team, uh, the lead today was Becky Ladolce and uh, Trey Russell Allen and Sharon Walton and Hafiza Salabai and Ruby Henderson. Next week, and we hope you can join us, uh, we are going to address the issue of the impact of the COVID-19 on addictions in San Francisco. And uh, it should be a very interesting conversation. Again, we thank you all for joining us today and thank you uh, presenters for this wonderful program. This concludes our program this week and we look forward to seeing you all next week.